Welcome back. Now, here's a man full of some very interesting contradictions. He was born into a staunchly Republican family, yet ended up saving more British lives than any other single person during the Second World War. He was ruthlessly hunted by a Gestapo chief, yet he ultimately befriended the Nazi butcher of Rome and converted him to Catholicism. History calls him the Vatican Pimpernel. But who was Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty? Here to give us an insight into the man and his deeds is Brian Fleming, author of the Vatican Pimpernel, a biography of the Irish Monsignor in Rome. You're very welcome, Brian. Thanks very much. Who, what was O'Flaherty doing in Rome from, from 1938? Well, essentially, he was a Vatican civil servant. He was working in the Holy Office, um, had worked in the in the Vatican all his life as a priest, uh, processing documents for consideration by those higher up in the in the church. Initially, I think he dismissed accounts of Nazi atrocities as Allied propaganda. Well, he was conscious of the fact that what he was reading was propaganda from both sides to a, to a degree, and he just sort of disregarded a whole lot and. What it seems triggered his, his thinking on the matter was when some Jews were rounded up in Rome in the middle of 1942 as a forced labour group and, and elderly people were forced to clean the streets and so on and so forth. And there was a picture of this in, in one of the newspapers and that finally convinced him that there was something wrong. Now, prior to that, he had visited concentration camps. The Pope at the time had appointed a Monsignor to visit the concentration camps and this Monsignor Duca had no English, so O'Flaherty went as his translator. And I think at that stage he had a sense that things weren't right. But what he did during that period, every day after the visit of the camp, O'Flaherty would get a train back to Rome, uh, and he spoke to a friend of his there that worked for Vatican Radio, and through that mechanism got messages home as to the fact that people were safe, albeit in prison. And how did people who needed help, how did they make contact with them? How did they even know that this was a man who you could make contact with who might be able to help you out? Well, I think he was a very gregarious sort of guy and he was well known in Rome well before the war and a very approachable guy. And indeed, even after the book was published, people spoke to me about how helpful he was to them and other things after the war. So he was just that sort of guy, big, tall man. Um, and uh, the word obviously went around if you needed something to do with the Vatican or a bit of a favour of any sort, O'Flaherty was your man. <laughs> Where did he hide all of these people? Because we're talking about, in total, something like 6,500 who would have gone through his hands in some shape or form. Most of them outside Rome, as it happens, because they were safer outside Rome. I mean, there wasn't the same Nazi presence outside Rome as there was in. But initially, he, when he was asked, people asked for help, he sent them to convents uh, and religious houses. He smuggled some into the Vatican. Uh, and then, as the numbers became bigger, he had to start to bore them out, for want of a better word, with local Italians who were supporting him. And eventually then, he rented two apartments. Presumably, he couldn't do all of this work on his own. Did he have a network of people who were helping him out? Initially, he had a network of civilians. Uh, he was very well known in Rome. He was a well known golfer. He knew a lot of people that had money in Rome and, and they supported him. He obviously knew a lot of the people in religious life. And he also knew a lot of the ordinary people in Rome. And eventually, then, when the numbers got so big, he uh, had help from the British Army, notably a fellow called Major Sam Derry. And uh, money? Where did the money come from for all of this? Well, he again, the, the people that were well-to-do in Rome that he knew were generous in contributing to him. And you have to remember that a lot of the Roman nobility weren't really, they were more pro-Allied than pro-Nazi, so they were quite happy to support him. Uh, so, and his own money, I mean, there's no doubt he impoverished himself through all of this. Now, the chief of the Gestapo in Rome was a Colonel Herbert Kapler. He knew about O'Flaherty's activities. Yes. Why didn't he arrest him? Why didn't he do anything about it? Well, you see, well, he was in the Vatican, he was safe, because it, uh, it's a neutral territory, so although there was always rumours that they might try and snatch him, and indeed did try and snatch him, they were reluctant to do so. But O'Flaherty wasn't very security conscious, so he often went outside the Vatican, uh, disguised, usually as a street cleaner, on one occasion, it's alleged he was disguised as a nun. I don't know what to make of that. But he had a few narrow escapes. Tell me about the narrow escapes and tell me about the attempts to snatch him. Well, one of the, the most dramatic one was when he went down to the Via del Corso to, meet, to visit Prince Doria Pamphili, who was one of his financial supporters. 
What he hadn't realised was uh, Kepler was keeping these places under observation. So he's in with Pamphili getting money upstairs in this huge palace, still there, and uh, the prince's secretary notices the commotion. And then they realised that whoever was keeping the place under observation had sent for Kepler, and there was a big group of SS men coming to the door. Now, the prince's advice to O'Flaherty was to give himself up, but he decided not to do that. So, And the place is huge, the palace is huge, so I suppose he thought he had a chance if he, if he went on the run within the palace. But anyway, for whatever reason, probably instinct, he ended up in the basement. And running along the basement, he noticed a chink of light coming in, and he realised then that there was a coal delivery underway. And these guys were delivering coal into a cellar. And he managed to attract their attention, um, and this coal man came down into the cellar to him, and uh, O'Flaherty took off his shirt and whatever he was wearing, his outer clothes, and he covered himself in coal dust. The coal man gave him a few sacks. You'll remember coal man yourself, Miles, I to bring do, the, the, do, the sacks do. back yeah. to the truck, or the handcart probably. So the coal man gave him a few sacks, and O'Flaherty put those on his back, and he walked out. So, I mean, the Pimpernel, the expression Pimpernel is perfectly appropriate in this oh, case. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, Derry, the, the, the major, the British Army major, was very security conscious, and O'Flaherty was the opposite, and, and they were great friends, obviously, but they fought about this on numerous occasions. Would, would everyone in the Vatican have approved of his activities? Presumably not. Well, they knew, and, I mean, he was a priest, and uh, my, my belief is if he was ordered to stop, he would have stopped. Um, Maybe I'm wrong, but I think so. And certainly Cardinal Montini, who was third in command at the Vatican and subsequently Pope uh, in the 50s, he gave him a telling off at one stage. Now, we've no account of that telling off, but my belief is he told, he explained to O'Flaherty that if he were caught, he was on his own, that mm. the Vatican couldn't intervene. I have no reason to believe he was told to stop. I think if he was told to stop, he would have. He would have protested, obviously, but above all, he was a priest. It's ironic that this Irishman from a staunch Republican background saved arguably more British lives than any other single person in World War Two. And the fact that we don't know a whole lot about it is, makes it doubly ironic. Uh, part of the problem, uh, part of the reason for that is, of course, he didn't publicise any of this himself after the war. Yeah, well, you've done that on his behalf uh, subsequently, which is good. But after the war, Kapler was tried, convicted of war crimes and was sentenced to life imprisonment. Only one person visited him in prison. Yeah, well, you know, the priesthood came out there as well. He, um, he, O'Flaherty visited him once a month in prison. And they established a relationship and perhaps a friendship. And eventually uh, he converted him to Catholicism. What was the story about Kapler then subsequently? There's a bit of a mystery around that. Uh, Kapler, it seems, became estranged from his wife at some stage. But he established a relationship with another lady. And in some time, I think it was 1972, though I didn't research this in great detail. But in 1972, he escaped from prison. And it's believed that this lady friend had bribed some of the prison guards and she brought him back to um, Germany and he died about 18 months later. Now, the, the Vatican's relationship with Nazi Germany has been obviously a controversial topic. And, and 10 years ago, newspapers reported that according to CIA archives, O'Flaherty may have been a Nazi informer, either wittingly or unwittingly. Were you able to develop that? Well, I mean, in, in more situations, you've put spies and counter spies, but... Uh, my memory of that, when, when that story broke a number of years ago, is the CIA very quickly, at a senior level, contradicted it. He was recognised after the war. I mean, he was decorated. He was given yeah, all sorts yeah. of honours by different countries after the war. He was. He? The British, uh, the Americans, the Italians uh, are the most notable, and they all gave him, and uh, his nephew has a collection of these medals. But still didn't, as far as you're concerned, get the kind of credit that he actually deserved from the public. Well, you know, I think he deserves great credit. It, it's a wonderful achievement. Um, the fact that he didn't publicise these events himself is part of that. And I think maybe the fact that he saved so many British lives wasn't that politically palatable in Ireland in the 50s and 60s. Uh, anybody who wants to see a cinematic representation of his life can look at a film called The Scarlet and the Black. Scarlet and the Black is is a good effort. I mean, it, it, it tampers with the truth in, in a number of ways. 
it understates, interestingly enough, the number of people he saved. But it, uh, Gregory Peck plays the part, and it, it's a good movie, yeah. Uh, Oscar Schindler saved 1,200 people. Yeah. O'Flaherty saved three times that number. Four. Four times five, that number. Five, if my mathematics is right. Uh, yeah, that's the extraordinary bit. I mean, a lot of Irish people will know who Oscar Schindler is. Mm. And not that many will know who O'Flaherty is. OK, well, he got uh, a stroke in 1960. He returned to Ireland. He died in 1963. And uh, he has uh, found his biographer in you. Thank Brian, you. Thank you very much indeed for coming in and uh, talking to us today about uh, the Vatican Pimpernel, Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty. That's it from this week's programme. We'll be back you, with you at the same time next week. Until then, from me, Miles Dungan and producer Yeti Redmond. Bye-bye.